I'm Andrea Van Hobbs, and welcome to the South Orange Report, where we feature the lifestyle and the leadership in the village of South Orange. And my special guest is the president of our lovely village, Ms. Sheena Cullum. Welcome, Madam President, and thanks for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much for having me. I have so many questions for you, um, and this is going to be fun. You know, uh, one of the easiest interviews you will probably have during your tenure. How's that? I love it. Okay, good. Let's go. I want to know, and the villagers would love to know, what has attracted you to stay on in South Orange after graduating from Seton Hall? And, <laughs> and, and why do you want to be the president of the village? Well, it's a long story. So I came to South Orange because I was on the speech and debate team at Seton Hall University. I was recruited from Starkville, Mississippi. And oh so my. I remember, uh, yeah, I remember my parents, uh, we were in my Isuzu Rodeo Sport. We're driving up. I've got one of those big TVs because flat screens weren't uh, invented yet. And so we've got all my clothes and the TV and we're like driving up to New Jersey. I can see my mom in the passenger side seat. She's got like tears and all that stuff. I'm um, letting go of her baby girl. We get into South Orange and I absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that we, we stopped by the Dunkin Donuts, a couple of the shops and I got out of the car and I'm just like, wow, I love it here. And so I, I fell in love from the get go. I'm like, there's a train station, there's a college. It just seemed all big and very city like, even though um, it was more suburban, but with access to the city. We get on the campus. Um, I remember going to freshman orientation, and one of the first questions was, you know, where are the city council meetings at? Oh you know, at that point, I was being judged by my colleagues. Of course, I run for, you know, uh, city our uh, class council and all that kind of stuff because I've always loved student government. And so I got here. I learned about the board of trustees. I started going to meetings when I was 17 at the time. I became addicted. Um, I started meeting residents in the community, and it was just. Um, kind of a love fest, like I just loved everything South Orange. And um, I got involved with advocacy groups. Uh, I think the first organization was the South Orange Alliance for Redevelopment. So I met some of the residents. Um, I started the Village Liaisons Committee on campus because I wanted to build kind of this um, college atmosphere. I thought we could be so much better than what we were in terms of building that Seton Hall and South Orange relationship. And that was kind of my first exposure to um, the residents and the town government and the so police department and all these folks. So you were plugged folks. in from the very beginning. Oh, everything, religiously. I, I set up my Maplewood online account, I think when I was like 19 years old. And oh I was like, goodness. look at this, look at all the debates that are happening. Um, and, and I just, I fell in love. People, and um, People are very passionate. Yeah, who live here about absolutely. the village. So what's your vision for the village now oh. that you are our Madam President? What isn't the vision? Well, um, going back to my time at Seton Hall, I always thought the opportunity was building a college town. Um, I'd love to see an anchor store of the university in our downtown. Um, I love student housing, housing in our commercial districts. I think there's a lot to be said about uh, retail and the shopping experience. We've got some great developments coming online, one being with Third and Valley. We saw finally the Bifus lot now finally. turned into the gateway. But, but uh, let me ask you, sure. what anchor stores are we targeting or are you specifically targeting? Well, the challenge is the parking standards. Yes. Uh, this is something that I talk about in conferences all the time, is that people say, like, can you get an anthropology? Can you get a Panera? All these big names. And normally, um, what they require is sufficient amounts of parking, which is not something that we can offer. In South Orange, um, in our downtowns, we follow a shared model of parking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when retailers locate to, say, Route 10 or Route 1, they're, they're counting the number of vehicles that are driving by. That's how they decide whether or not they're going to create a destination destination store. When you're in communities like South Orange, smart growth communities, what they're looking for is pedestrian traffic. Yes. And we have, um, with us right now, we have some good developments happening in our business corridors. We, we have Seton Hall, which at any given time has 10,000 um, faculty, staff, and students that contribute to foot traffic. And then our train station, which is really important, which boasts roughly 4,000 riders every single day um, going into the city or other destinations. So our cell for these big retailers in the absence of parking is to be able to say the pedestrian traffic is steady. You're going to have a lot of people walking right in front of your storefront at any given time. So, so that's our the, selling. So who are the targets? Oh gosh, we have so many targets. I can tell, tell you tomorrow. Tell me one, one good one. I can tell you, I can't give you the specific name, but um, tomorrow uh, myself along with Bob Zuckerman, who's the executive mm -hmm. director of the Village Center Alliance, we are meeting with a Korean restaurant um, because mm. I am half Korean. My mother is <laughs> Korean. And so I, I told Bob one of the first things uh, was I would love 
to have a Korean restaurant. And so I took a picture of bibimbap, which is one of the signature dishes yes. uh, of the Korean world. And uh, I put it on Facebook thinking it could be crickets. And then all of a sudden there's like 250 likes, there's comments, there's we love bibimbap. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we've got to get a Korean restaurant. Wow. Um, and so that's one thing. I've also been working with Seton Hall because I'd love to have their campus bookstore in our central business district. Like we need some type of anchor that shows you as soon as you get into South Orange, as soon come. as you get off the train, like this is South Orange home to Seton Hall University. Mm -hmm. And I think having a welcome center, uh, a bookstore, if you look at the gateway, they call it the gateway in New Brunswick, where they have a bookstore, yes. Barnes and Nobles mixed, and they partnered with Rutgers University is a really great an anchor mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, business district. And I feel like we could do something really cool uh, mixed with a cafe or of some sort, mm -hmm. but just having that presence would be wonderful. Um, there's a new, uh, where the family buffet is, there's a Thai um, mm -hmm. restaurant, a uh, fusion place coming in there. Um, in the Neelam spot, uh, there's another Indian restaurant. So mm -hmm. there, there is a lot of interest. And what I think people say is there's a lot of vacant storefronts. Yes. A lot of those properties, um, there are people who are developers who are looking to redevelop blocks. So it is no fault of our Village Center Alliance or the lack of recruitment is that the property owners right now are looking to make significant renovations and investments into those existing properties. Wonderful. And that's why some of those spots don't have new tenants because bringing in somebody to say, eventually you're gonna have to leave in the next six months and a year isn't really fair. So that's why they're remaining um, so empty right now. We're going to come back to the developments. Okay. Let me ask you about the first few months in office. Mm -hmm. I would ask my daughter when she was in primary school at the end of every day, yeah. what are your roses, what are your thorns? So what were the wonderful things about the day mm -hmm. and what were the challenging things? So what have your roses been since mm -hmm. taking office and what are the thorns? And essentially, what do you know now mm -hmm. that had you known day one, two, and three, Okay would have made life so much easier for you. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you the truth. We're on camera. <laughs> okay, so I love every second of it. It is everything that oh, I on. hoped it would be. Come no, on. it is absolutely true. Um, Everybody I plays love, nice. I, no, no, and that's the part that's so exciting about it is that you meet all these different personalities and ultimately, and I use this um, example on the campaign trail is that there's all these moving pieces to any good community. Everybody has their interests, things that they want to see, things that they really dislike. Um, and it is the job of the village president and the governing body to create the total picture. Is that we've got to, we're continuously shifting puzzle pieces around to try and create what this beautiful picture is. And for me, it's Destination South Orange. I always use that, uh, we, we coined that phrase in our uh, campaign to talk about South Orange being a destination for anything and everything people want out of this community. And so I think the challenging part is what makes me uh, the most happy. Um, the downside is I hadn't anticipated the time commitment. Um, I did a lot as a trustee. I was on the mm -hmm. governing body for two years. I was a volunteer for 14 years. Like I, I'm not scared of hard work. Um, but because it's a small community, we have 16,000 residents and then we have 10,000 on Seton Hall's campus, there's a personal connection um, that people have with me and that I have with them where we're on Facebook or we're on Twitter or I've been to neighborhood meetings where people feel very comfortable just calling me directly or emailing me directly and expecting a, a pretty quick response because we have those relationships. And I, I run so out of create some boundary. I, now. I've run out of time in the day, and um, because I spend a lot of time behind the computer and in meetings, um, it's it stopped me from being with what I deem the most desirable part of the job, which is with the people that I serve. Um, I loved going to neighborhood meetings and block parties and events, and those were all the things that I felt great about. Is because then you get to actually listen to people, and you're, hey, what do you think about this? You get all these informal conversations with folks about what they what they like, what they don't like, what they don't understand, and the questions, so what and the I wish I had more of those answers. So what are the hot buttons from people going to your community meetings and activities? What are you hearing? Well, what do most, people really want? Or what is the village that, what isn't the village that yeah. people would like it to be? Well, I think the most recent is public safety. And um, I have a lot of data on this because I chaired the public safety mm -hmm. committee for, for two years. Um, prior to getting elected to the board of trustees, I was the chair of the citizens public <laughs> safety committee. Um, so public safety is something that's very important to me. And what I tell residents, because we'll have incidents happen, um, you know, uh, we're, we're just, we're not in a bubble. We don't live in a bubble where, where 
we don't experience crime, we do. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, my experience and that of the governing body and how we feel about public safety is we like to get information out to people through, we have an online police blotter, we use our neighborhood watch organization, um, we let our community, community relations folks know that when things happen we want to share with the residents, we want them to be empowered with knowledge, um, but with that comes a perception from folks that crime might be actually just, increasing mm -hmm. and, and that's just not the case at all. In fact, we've been in a continuous decline of um, part one crime, which is serious crimes, over the past five years. In fact, um, during the campaign, I produced a chart that showed a 40% decre decrease in crime, uh, part one crimes. So People it's, certainly can't um, choose this as a destination yeah. if they're concerned about, yeah. about public safety. Absolutely. And I mean, our at the end of the day, we have theft. Um, that's probably the one that we see the most. Um, if you look at our part one crime information and um, our crime index, Seton Hall's population is not calculated in the number of people that we have living in this community. So you might see it and say, wow, it seems like South Orange has a little bit more than its surrounding towns, meaning Maplewood or Milburn or these desirable communities that people say, we want crime indexes like that. And it's because that 10,000 plus mm. population, because they are not, um, around residents mm -hmm. aren't calculated. So say you're having a frat party and then you know a fight happens or something, um, it's counted in, in the part mm -hmm. one crimes, but the population of the students who are here nine months out of the year um, don't calculate into the actual crime index. So the public safety is an issue. Yes. Um, our educational system is mm -hmm. always going to be an issue given yeah. the amount of of, of taxes mm -hmm. that our village residents pay. Sure. What are the educational system issues that you're tackling and how are you how are you doing on that? Well I think one of the things that I'm committed to and is the entire Board of Trustees is actually working better with the Board of Education. What I've seen and what I witness is a disconnect between what the municipalities are doing both South Orange and Maplewood and the policies of the Board of Education. Um, I have a great relationship with all the board members. Um, I've committed that when they need things to reach out um, documentation, numbers, um, student information, what, whatever it may be, like we have to be partners. Mm -hmm. um, we are now meeting regularly, uh, informally, with administrators from both Maplewood um, and the school district and South Orange to talk about issues. Our next meeting is this coming, or not this Thursday, the following Thursday, um, so that we're having an ongoing conversation. Um, and do I you think have a sense of what the two most pressing issues are? Well, I think uh, the state aid one is one that uh, one of the Board of Ed members, Jeff Bennett, he's just been a champion. And uh, we talk about how we're underfunded as a district, um, but ultimately we don't have a much or much political clout in the state house, and I think that's a problem. So we South have to Orange, amp up our, our lobbyist Well, you activity. know, here's the thing. I don't even think we need a lobbyist. I think we need to, as I, as I shared with Mr. Bennett, if we're able to connect with all the other districts who are in our exact same position, we're underrated. Some districts are overrated mm -hmm. and really what we're just looking is for our fair share if we are able to touch every single one of those municipalities who are under aided like us soon it's not 16,000 residents in South Orange or 25,000 in Maple it's the soon you're members. a coalition of a lot of these first suburbs where you can really start um, to lobby on behalf of tens if not hundreds of thousands of people who are in the same position that we are we'll hold that thought okay we're gonna take a break and we'll be right back with the South Orange Report and our village president, Ms. Sheena Cole. Television is a powerful and influential medium that allows different groups the opportunity to produce programming that directly affects their own communities. Public, educational, and government access channels ensure that all people, regardless of race, age, gender, disability, religion, or economic status, have access to local government information and the use of a public communication forum. Make sure everyone has a voice. Support your local PEG channels. Welcome back to the South Orange Report, and it is my pleasure to have our village president, Sheena Cullum. So Madam President, just before the break, we were having a rousing conversation about a few things. Sure. I want to get back to the discussion of the development. Okay. Is the commercial and residential development good mm -hmm. for our village? Mm -hmm. Yes, no. 
um, a lot of conversation about the development being good for the developers because land is so valuable. Sure. Are we giving them tax abatements? So how is the development good for the village okay. and the villagers? All right. We could be here for a few days talking <laughs> about all these. Um, so I guess the most... Because I think this is a pressing issue. It really is. As people see the burgeoning sure. developments and the, and the traffic patterns changing. Absolutely. Um, I think responsible development is really important for South Orange. If you look at our state development and redevelopment plan, we're considered a growth area for the state. And what defines, and, and professionally, I forgot to mention this earlier, I'm the executive director of the American Planning Association in New Jersey. Um, so I work with professional planners, transportation experts, um, developers, uh, land use attorneys. So I get to see all different sides to this discussion. And I think that what we're doing in South Orange is very responsible. It's very environmentally friendly, and it's what makes us a leading smart growth community. So if you think about uh, a growth area and why we're a growth area, I don't want to say an overgrowth area, but just <laughs> a growth area where we can handle some capacity, is that sprawl costs this state and this country a lot of money. When you start building single-family homes out in the middle of nowhere, uh, the infrastructure that's necessary for those developments, whereas right now what both millennials and baby boomers are looking for is what we're really positioned to develop um, and deliver on, which is kind of compact growth. And what I mean by that is um, denser units in our core downtown, our central business district, where people and the parking standards aren't high. Most of those folks aren't bringing two vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, they're not bringing school-aged children. We have those numbers. And ultimately, they're, they're low municipal and school costs. So you have folks who are adding to the local economy. Um, but are they really adding to the local economy to the degree to which we might be planning and I'm asking mm -hmm. because if these are millennials mm -hmm. they're are they uh, in terms of the demographics and psychographics are they commuting back to New York so they're spending all of their dollars in New York and are they coming here to do what I call bedroom out are they coming here to go to sleep and they get up the next day and they depart so are they really contributing to the local economy the way in which we have planned um, I don't have the data right in front of me, but okay. there there are models that project um, the annual spending of people who are commuters into the to the city. Um, you'll generally have what we've seen from our numbers in South Orange is that we are attracting young professionals. Um, both aren't commuting into the city. You might have one person um, who either stays at home or they work locally, and then you have one commuter. Um, and then ultimately, to spend all your time in the city is probably unlikely um, you're going to capture a lot of that market on weekends um, where they're not driving to destinations. You either have the option to take the train into the city or you're shopping locally. And, and if our you Midtown look at, Direct Train is such a great facilitator of getting yes. us in to the city quickly. Well, that's a that's a total other story because I just had a meeting um, in Trent to talk about train capacity, which is where my biggest concerns are. Um, and I'll address that in a moment. But overall, um, adding people into our central business district which is something that has always been in our vision plans and all of our master planning um, documents and what is smart strategic planning um, for our community I do think is a good thing. Um, when it comes to tax breaks, um, it, it, everybody has kind of misunderstandings about how this works. That's why, Madam um, President, you're here to yeah. help clear up that nebulousness. This isn't a, a scenario where a developer comes in and we say, here, we're just going to give you a tax exemption or a payment in lieu of taxes or an annual service charge. A development may not occur without the incentive. And normally when you look at North Jersey, it's very different from South Jersey. You see a lot of pilots and tax incentives in place because of the high cost of aggregating yes. land. Um, South Orange has a history of not using eminent domain or the strong mm -hmm. arm of government. What we normally expect from developers is that they privately negotiate um, with landowners to assemble lots that are large enough for a substantial development. You don't want just a single family home all of a sudden now being 10 stories into the air. Mm -hmm. So we have private developers who have to assemble or land bank. Um, normally there are give backs. We, we expect certain environmental standards or bonuses for um, lead certifications, mm -hmm. energy efficiency. In the instance of if you look at Third and Valley, where people are like, oh, yes. it was a big, I didn't vote on that. I wasn't on the board at the time, but I could certainly explain it. Um, what you have there is 215 units. 
Um, and we are getting substantial parking spaces that if we were to build ourselves, it is more expensive. When government does something, it's always more expensive. There's certain costs that we incur that the private sector does not. Um, so they had the 215 units. We get $700,000 from an annual service charge. Um, and if you look at a parking space, what it takes municipal government to actually build mm -hmm. surface parking or structured parking, it could be ranging anywhere from twenty to forty thousand dollars per space. So however you try and dice that, if you say twenty five thousand per space times two hundred and fifteen spaces that were built by the developer mm -hmm. for us, um, first to relocate all the transit parkers, but now when those transit parkers aren't in there, it's parking for everyone. Um, and there was a net increase obviously. We also got affordable housing on site, which is really important. Um, there's gonna be roughly twenty or so units, um, two with a veteran's preference which is something I introduced that I'm pretty excited about. That's um, wonderful. We got $1.1 million for the relocation and the building of a new rescue squad. Now that's something that it, it's more valuable to the developer, obviously, to have the units, but the rescue squad has been asking for a new headquarters for so long. It's something that they always plan for, mm -hmm. um, but that was village land at the time, and the board of trustees said, hold on, like, you don't want to build new headquarters because ultimately if this gets, if this land gets redeveloped, um, then all of a sudden, you know, your, mm -hmm. your new headquarters Orders might need to be relocated. So they waited. They got $1.1 million out of that. Um, we had $250,000 or so dollars come in from the developer uh, for relocation of the parking, which ultimately we're putting towards alternative transportation, which I'm really excited about. <coughs> Hmm. Excuse me. So ultimately, um, you have to look at the total package, mm -hmm. and a municipality cannot just give tax abatements away. Um, developers have to go through a pro forma to show us their numbers. We have a lot of professionals um, outside the governing body, specifically our redevelopment council and his team, go through everything that comes in to see if this makes sense. So the belief is that when we are weighing the pros and the cons, yes. that the villagers mm -hmm are accruing some significant benefits yes. that may outweigh mm -hmm. that which we're giving away. Exactly. So that's and that's, trade. that's what it comes down to. And I watch all these politicians and I'm I just I don't even like thinking of myself as a politician. That's kind of weird. Like I'm like a student government nerd. Is that um, everything is balanced. There's not like, you know, when you hear people like this is the right thing to do, blah blah blah. Like you do your best with the information and the opportunities that are presented to you. Um, with that lot, it was surface parking. It's like is our community character uh, mm -hmm. a surface parking lot or an old gas station that's contaminated. Um, when we look at some of our other development opportunities, um, the Bifus lot, mm -hmm. which is now the gateway. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate um, having um, shopper parking yeah. on the corner of Church Street mm -hmm. and South Orange Avenue. Absolutely. You know, the bane of my existence was trying to find parking downtown. Yeah. As a, as a 20 year resident of South mm -hmm. Orange, just coming downtown to shop. I mean, I can walk you know, the mile from my house, but if sure. I'm driving and want to park downtown, it was always a nightmare. So I appreciate that lot with three lovely hours to just meander downtown. Mm -hmm. But thinking about the millennials and the people that we're attracting, mm -hmm. do we have the destination mm -hmm. South Orange profile? What, what, what do we think we need to have? Do we need a concierge at the train station to help people with their dry cleaning? Like, what do we need to attract those people? And again, I'm just wondering if the supply mm -hmm. is outpacing the demand. I would say the answer is no, that it's not. Okay. Um, South Orange, I think, is very well positioned to capture what I refer to as the New York market. Um, if you think about our commute time, the 30 minutes into the city, um, even during the recession, South Orange, I don't want to say we were recession proof, but we fared communities like South Orange and Maplewood and Summit. Um, communities that had mass transit fared a lot better mm -hmm. during the recession. And are we a dis destination now? No. But do I think we can be? Absolutely. Um, there's one thing that I'll say, and I, I would like to tout Montclair a little bit, is that I, I like to go to other towns to see what's happening mm -hmm. during their nighttime hours. And places like Georgetown is another example. Absolutely. It's on D.C. Uh, a few weeks ago. Or Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, we shut down around 8 or 9 o'clock, even after governing body meetings. I go out and there's not a lot of options, and I would like to keep us open 
more throughout the night, um, give opportunities for the college students to have something to do in our central business district. Because if we're not providing those opportunities in the CBD, um, then they're happening in residential areas. So and that's what, what we we're need? trying to. So what do we need in the CBD? More anchors. I do think that Landmark, uh, we recently sold our Village Hall. I think Landmark is going to be a destination. Um, anchors like Above and Ashley Marketplace, those are what I call anchors, is that they locate or they choose South Orange. And yeah, it might be a tax incentive that gets them here, but then all of a sudden, you see investment come around them. In the instance of Village Hall, which is going to be um, from one of the best restaurant groups in the state of New Jersey, there's going to be a beer garden outside. I'm not encouraging drinking, um, but it's going to activate that corner. And I, I can guarantee you that we will see investment that's moving more um, east on South Orange Avenue. And as we strategically get more anchors throughout the town, then you'll see investment happen around them. Mm -hmm. I think that we have the right people in place. It takes a little bit of time. Getting the vision together takes a little bit of time. But we're seeing a lot of new people get engaged in the process. We're seeing all new volunteers come Great. forward and say, like, we're passionate about South Orange. We want to have uh, be a part of helping out. So and things have come along. Are they are act activating. Activating, do you think, because Absolutely. of your energy and enthusiasm? Or is this just the right time, like an arc? of activism? I think it's a little bit of both. First, I think positive energy is contagious, and no, many, no matter how many times I get beat down or somebody's not happy about something, like I try to keep that positive outlook. Like Every day you wake up, if you look in the mirror and you say, like I tried my best, I worked as hard as I can, I'm ready for the next day. I think positive energy is really, really important, even if it means that people are going to disagree with you, because that's welcomed. Uh, I don't mind being wrong. I'm you know, I'm not the smartest one in the room unless I'm talking to myself. Um, and, and even then, who knows? Um, so I like having smart people around me and I'm always pitching um, volunteerism like come help okay you don't like this come be a part of the committee process so um, how do people get involved Okay, so there's a million different ways. I think the way typically people get involved is they know somebody, and then that person is like, oh, yeah, absolutely, come check out this committee meeting. On the Village website right now, which we are redoing, I know it's looking a little beat right now, uh, there's a volunteer directory. You can go read about all the different opportunities. You submit your resume. It's not like this intense vetting. <laughs> like, we're happy to have volunteers. Most of our committees, you can just sit in and participate because um, we're getting a lot of value from that. Um, you submit your resume, what you're interested in, it, uh, what you're interested in um, the Board of trustees reviews all of that and then we make appointments mm -hmm. and if and if one of the committee assignments is full or it's a statutory board then we'll redirect you to another committee um, until you know what you're looking for becomes available and um, Steve Schnall is actually great he's one of my colleagues on the board of trustees he is all about civic engagement so mm -hmm. he is pulling in new people people who haven't been the ones who have done all the volunteering the past 10 years you don't want a small group of people making all the decisions is it young people is it older people is there a combination of communities participating? Um, you know what, right now, unfortunately, I, I think that it does tend to be a little bit older of a group, um, more male. Um, you know, it's weird if you were if you were to actually look at the demographics. I don't know why that is, but I know that we are making a conscious effort to try and pull in more diversity that Wonderful. reflects our community Wonderful. and each of the different committee opportunities or, or boards or commissions. Great. I would like this to be like Scheherazade, where you come back and talk more. I have about so much all the to talk things about. Going on, I know. And I'm, I'm going to so like peek over at the time. I'm like, no way. Where did this time totally go? We're just gone. getting started. But it's great. Thank you yeah. so much for coming. Of course, it's, it's been wonderful. And there are so many more things that our villagers would love to know about our Madam President sure. and about what's going on. So, okay. you must promise to come back and talk to us more. I'll be back. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. This is Andrea Fan Hobbs. Thank you so much for joining us on the South Orange Report.